Hi, everyone. I'm attorney Donna DiMaggio Berger, and this is Take It to the Board, where we speak condo and HOA. It's no secret that Florida community associations need hundreds of millions of dollars for repair and maintenance projects right now. So my guest today is the man with the money. Mr. Cole is the first vice president of commercial lending at Valley National Bank. For the past 16 years, he has specialized in financing for capital improvement projects for condominiums, homeowners associations, and country clubs. Brewster, welcome to Take It to the Board. Thank you very much. Great to be here. So happy to have you here. Like I said, you're the man with the money, and people need the money right now. So first, I want to know, how long has Valley National Bank been involved with loans to condominiums, cooperatives, and homeowners associations? Yeah, that's a, it's a fair question. For, first of all, I was originally with a bank called First United Bank, which is a local community bank here. That's how we started. And uh, Valley purchased us about five years ago. I don't know if they've ever kind of was in this business down here in South Florida, but they, they like what we did. They said, keep doing what you're doing. And so a lot of the decision making, the servicing was all here in South Florida and still continues to be for this marketplace. So we can decision uh, bigger loans up to $15 million locally, which is pretty nice. And uh, we can close them relatively quickly, too. So Valley's probably been doing it for about five or six years locally. I think they were doing some cooperative lending in New York City, too. But that's sort of a a little bit different up there. I think I told you this before, but straight out of law school, I worked for a small boutique uh, law firm in Miami, and they were bank counsel, bank counsel for Sky Lake State Bank. So I started out um, closing loans, small business loans, uh, straight out of law school. Cool. Don't, don't do that now. And I'm, you know, not, not looking to delve back into it, but that was kind of my background. You mentioned co-ops. So once upon a time, you know, we've got, I wouldn't say a huge number of cooperatives in Florida, and certainly it's nothing like the New York market. But we do have a lot of co-ops, a lot of older co-ops in very desirable coastal locations. Oh, I'm very familiar with them. Yeah. and But once upon a time, it was very difficult for co-ops to get financing. Has that changed? Yeah, there's two, there's two different, obviously, there's two different types of financing. You can't, you still can't get financing to buy a co-op as a, as a shareholder, if you will. But as far as a cooperative borrowing money as an entity for a capital improvement project, they certainly can. It's a different set of statutes, as you know, it's 719. It's basically the same rules. It's basically the same docs and all that stuff. And, and we can do it. And I've been very successful in doing it, too. I, I just want to say for, for our listeners, you can get some financing if you're going to buy a cooperative unit. It has opened up yeah, uh, a yeah. little bit. It's not back in the old all cash days, although I do have some clients that do have all cash in their buildings. But definitely, definitely a niche lender. It, it is. It's a, it's a niche lender. So has your bank developed a set of loan documents specifically geared towards association lending? Because I tell you, I remember I I started out saying I was bank counsel. Well, of course, that was for corporations, small businesses. You know, we would seek personal guarantees from the owners of those companies. It's a completely different ballgame when you're dealing with an association. So my first question is, do you have documents that are actually geared to how associations operate? So, So the answer is yes and no. Um, those in the industry know of documentation it's called Laser Pro. Uh, they're known throughout the industry and they're built, you know, they're created by attorneys and they're very boilerplate. And so we use Laser Pro up to three and a half million dollars. However, we can't really amend them much because probably 80 percent of the language in there is doesn't really apply to these types of loans. Again, they're quite boilerplate, but we do allow addendums and amendments added in and sort of bolted on at the back end. So we do, yes. And uh, but anything over three and a half million, it's always attorney prepared documents, and obviously they're very proprietary, and they go back and forth between the two respective councils and and get them perfected. I was going to say, I know you know my partner Mark Friedman, and oh, yeah. he's not going to accept boilerplate. I know that's one hundred percent correct. I'll have to tell Mark to listen to this episode. So, what do you look for? What does Valley National look for when you're evaluating an association as a potential borrower? Sure. That's a good question. I mean, everyone wants to know, well, I want to apply and I, you know, what do I have to be? So some of the things that we look at is just to make sure that the loan amount is commensurate with the value of the unit. So if you're living in Century Village, when I have a lot of clients that do, they're not, they're not looking to borrow a million dollars. There's 24 units, maybe 50000 or $100,000 to redo the roofs, and that's got to make sense. So that's one of the things we look at. We look at you know, the valuations of the units. 
More importantly, though, we look at their AR aging, their delinquency ratios, anything over 90 days. And we evaluate it two different ways. We look at the number of units that are past 90 and divide that into the total number of units and get a percentage. And then we look at the actual dollars and divide that into the budget to get another percentage. Sometimes there's a story to tell. Sometimes you have a bunch of folks like we had, what was it, 10 or 15 years ago, we had lots of AR aging and it was really through the roof. And it was harder for guys like me to get loan approval from the banks. So I decided to really put together a narrative and do some deep diving and figure out, well, okay, maybe not all of them are doing it on purpose. Maybe there's a story there. You know, maybe maybe there's a death in the family. Maybe it, it's in probate, you know, so I would do that. And I haven't had to do that very often lately because AR has been pretty clean. But that's one of the bigger things we look at. And the second thing we look at would be their insurance. We can't adhere ourselves as as an additional mortgagee or their insurance. We can't collect the insurance if if something happens, but we can review it in our underwriting to make sure that at least makes a a benchmark for replacement value that we have. So we do want to do that. How challenging is that in today's property insurance market where associations are struggling to, to get sufficient coverage? And even if their documents require full replacement value or law and ordinance, I mean, are you looking at the governing documents first to see this is what this association is required to have in terms of coverage and then looking at what's feasible in the marketplace? Not necessarily, not not from an underwriting perspective. We just want to make sure that they're covered to a certain degree. You know, we'll let the attorneys really kind of go into that stuff and then we will we'll rely upon them to provide us an opinion letter based on their review of other other docs and everything else to make sure that we're we're in good space. But I mean, honestly, you know, when we're reviewing them, if I see something that's, you know, out of line, I'll call them up on it or I'll speak to their attorney about it and say, this isn't this doesn't look right. So it's it's not like, you know, it's it's not just a rubber stamp. We do look at it and we do analyze it, but there's nothing per se that's in there that's going to be a trigger unless there really is one. Do you care about how many units are leased? What percentage of units are leased in the building? Yeah, we do. And, and that's another story to tell as far as a deep dive. And I can get into that. Like, for example, if, if we have one one controlling person that owns more than a certain percentage, 10 percent, that's going to be an issue for us. Why? Why is that an issue? Let's say you're a 24 unit building yeah. and one person owns five units. Why is that problematic? Because the all banks are a little bit different. And they all have the risk tolerance. And that's something that we wrote years ago. Uh, we can do an exception. But, you know, right out of the gate, if it doesn't check that box, it needs to be explained and figured out why. And let me get into that for you with you, because I do have an explanation about that. Again, we're not going to mention any names, right? No borrowers. You can't mention any of that. But I like I lent a, a significant amount of money to a very large association in Jupiter to do tons of uh, concrete restoration, roofs, the whole nine. And out of their 700 or so uh, units, there were about 200 or so that were rented. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. That's going to, that may be a problem. Well, let me, de- let me dive into it. Let me see who the ownership are. Well, I found out that the majority of the owners of those rented units are owned by owners, not by investors. So that really speaks well of how the owners feel of their building. If I live in a unit and I think it's a great place and I have an opportunity to buy another unit for income, I really love this place. So that sort of tips the scale a bit. So when my my team says, well, I have X amount of renters, I'm like, well, do the deep dive and find out who owns what. You may be able to discover that it's either investor owned or it's owner owned. And if it's owner owned, that can make us feel better. Even though you have that investor owned caveat, we can get paid if the investor stops paying. Now, the challenge from an underwriting perspective is trying to get the guys in underwriting to really understand that and feel more comfortable about that because it is specialized. And so from a broad stroke, we don't like a lot of investors. It's just one of our things. But I think we're going to be changing that tune soon. Do you care if the associations involved in litigation, whether they're the plaintiff or the defendant? Yeah, that's one of our questionnaire questions that we check the box. Is there a lawsuit going on? And if so, what is it? You know, if it's just a slip and fall or something simple, okay, great. But if it's something more egregious, like a lien holder or or maybe um, some sort of a lien from a builder, that's going to be a problem. So, yeah, we care about that. Well, let's say, and I assume, again, this is a conversation between you and association counsel. Hey, what's what's the nature of this litigation? You know, if maybe it's a roof project where the, the roofer didn't deliver and they're now suing the contractor for poor performance or breach of contract, that, that in and of itself wouldn't disqualify them. Not necessarily, but it, it, it's something that we have to address case by case. So you've talked about a couple deep dives. So how long do all this does this dive time take? 
Like from the time they apply, how long does your due diligence period typically take? Well, what I like to do is, so we have two levels of underwriting in the bank, up to a million five is sort of really simple for us to do. And anything over that goes to a whole different set of folks. And then above 15 million goes to those set of folks, and it may even go up all, all the way up to the board. So we have to couch our uh, our borrowers and let them know that. Like, for example, I just did a, a loan for Singer Island. It was $11 million, and it took all the way, to, probably took... I'd say three to four weeks to commitment letter. Oh, okay. that's not that's not too bad. No, no, it's not bad. I mean, you know, I, I try to gather as much as I can to present to underwriting. And my job is to you know mitigate the amount of questions coming after I've already submitted my financials. So I always let the borrowers know there, there could be questions that you know I don't know that they might want to have asked. So sometimes they ask them, sometimes they don't. They usually do, though. And then it usually goes to the senior underwriter. It's like, well, you never asked about this one. I'm like, oh, gosh, OK. And sometimes it just needs to be explained. So I said in the intro that you've been in the capital and you know, for capital improvement projects. And when I hear capital improvement, I, I'm thinking good things. You know, maybe they're refurbishing the pool and the pool deck or the clubhouse or what have you. I don't think maintenance and repair projects for capital improvement necessarily a lot of these communities, I said at the outset, that are going to need hundreds of millions, if not a billion dollars in Florida to undertake perhaps deferred maintenance, repair projects. Then, you know, there's a new condo safety law where there's going to be milestone inspections and there's going to be deadlines to perform all that work. Is there going to be a problem with those associations who are under the gun to be eligible for financing? You, you talked about the things you look at in terms of whether or not they're a good fit. Is that going to work against any of these associations? That yeah, it, 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 it may very well. I mean, and you just made a very good point. You know, the capital improvement project scenario is something that we do, but we all, I've been asked by, by council to sort of change language to just say repair and maintenance sometimes because they want to just, it's just repair and maintenance. And it is just repair and maintenance, whether you're replacing a roof or you're doing concrete restoration, it's all consistent with repair and maintenance. Although, something that large certainly can fall into what can be described as a capital improvement as well. But to your point, yeah, I'm, I'm very concerned about the new law when it comes to lesser valued condominium associations. Are they going to be able to qualify? I'm a little nervous about it, to be honest with you. So We've heard that the state may possibly offer low interest loans. Have you heard anything? Do you think that that's a, that that's a possibility? I think that's smart. I know the SBA used to do disaster loans, obviously, when we had huge hurricanes came through, and I've run into a few of those and, and asked to be subordinated and when we went in for another loan, which was quite surprising. The SBA was very accommodating. Uh, I actually got a guy on the phone after I looked up the UCC1 and I found his name and phone number. I called him and he answered the phone, <laughs> <laughs> so, which was surprising. So, But I think, yeah, I think that'd be great if the state does step in and do that, because I don't know how else you do it. A lot of these smaller communities, I'm I'm very concerned. I think the pendulum maybe went a little bit too far in, in, these, in these mandates. I know that the, the more Tony buildings on Palm Beach and such have been fighting funding reserves for years because they have the wherewithal to write a check. And well, good for them, but we have to have a consistency across the board for everybody. And yeah, uh, I, I think when we come out the other end of this, we're going to have safe housing stock in Florida. But right now we're in, you know, we're in the middle of it and it's, Actually, we're at the beginning of it, I should say. So we have to see how it plays out. But but financing is going to be critical. And and when the state says low interest rate, what would that be right now? What do you think a low interest loan would be? As of today, (laughs) I mean, (laughs) what I'm quoting for 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 ten year paybacks is about five and a half. Five and a half now. Wow, that has climbed. Where do you see that going? Six and a half to seven. By when? Three months. You heard it here, folks. Get but I will. Time. But I will say, though, I mean, I've always led with this. You know, the, it's interesting we, we're, since we're talking about interest rates. Interest rates is, is usually the first thing that people ask me, like, what is your interest rate on this loan? And I respond with, well, I can tell you, but it really shouldn't really be your go to matter. And let me explain to you why. I said all your life as a consumer, you've had a home mortgage, you've had a car loan, you have a credit card. And you have this interest rate and you want to get the best deal for you. I said, but you, you're not taking into consideration the economies of scale of your 1,227 homeowners that are all paying into this. So if it's 5% or 5.5%, the monthly payment changes 25 cents. I mean, it doesn't move the needle. 
you, you know, I, and, and there are banks out there and a lot of them that have always sort of undercut the next guy by giving the best interest rate, but have fallen on their face when it comes to servicing the loan, and really taking care of the client. I've never been the lowest out there and I probably never will be, but I can tell you what we do do. We underwrite locally. We service right away. We fund draw requests within an hour. We just, we know how to service these loans. So I try to sell that to them and I don't want them to get all worked up on the interest rate. Is it important? Well, of course it's important. Sure, it's a factor, but it's, it's like, every, you know, what you're mentioning that we're seeing across industries, you know, right. everything's so highly commoditized. Same thing with law firms. What's your hourly rate without taking into account what what's your success rate? What's the communication going to be like? What's the response time going to be like? You're right. All of those other factors. 100%. It's like I have a team. I have a team that I, I put in place. And when a draw request come through, we're all copied on. So there's like, you know, literally three or four people that get that email at all at the same time. So that loan request will be funded an hour, whether by me or someone on the team. There's never anyone sleep at the wheel. So let's talk about the cost of quality then. <laughs> right. <laughs> Interest. What would it? What would it? What are the costs typically? And I'm sure it's a sliding scale depending on on the size of the loan. But what are the costs for you know, let's say a million a million dollar loan? So a million dollar, yeah, that's fair. So a million dollar loan, you know, the bank fee is going to be anywhere between 25 basis points and 50 basis points, and that's negotiable. And that for a million dollars, you don't have to use attorney prepared docs. So the charge for the loan for our loan fees are probably about 850 bucks. You'll have the doc stamps, which will be 35 cents per uh, per 100, and it caps at 24.50. So a million bucks, it's capped at that. So I would have to say a million dollars, certainly less than one percent. Folks, don't forget you have to pay your own association counsel for the opinion of counsel letter. Yes, you do, and that can vary. <laughs> well, it does vary. Well, it does because as 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 lawyers, we're taking on a risk. In 100%. Right. percent. You're, you're basing your decision to fund and close right. that loan on whether or not the association has the authority to enter into that transaction. Now, the cost of higher, you know, higher loan values, anything three to three point five and four up, banks counsel starts at about five thousand for to prepare loan docs. And I would have to say, you know, borrowers counsel is probably close to that as well. So now we're talking some real money. But, you know, these are not out of these are not out of pocket expenses. They're part of the loan proceeds. And they should be because you want to make sure it's buttoned up properly. You want to make sure everyone's represented and you want to make sure that it's done right. So, Brewster, how do you decide the limit for an association? Maybe the association comes to you and they say, we need $10 million. How do you decide maybe you don't need $10 million or we're not comfortable? We're comfortable giving you half of that. How do you right, make so, that? Well, what I do is I, I quickly kind of I, I just jump into my amortization schedule and I bang out how much it's going to cost per month. And then I divide it by the units. And I figure out what it's going to cost per unit per month. And then I look at what they're normally paying their dues on. So if they're paying $500 a month in dues and the loan's going to cost you $450, well, that's not going to work. I mean, it might work, but it's probably not going to work. The bank's not going to improve such an increase. It, it depends, though. I mean, if it's, if, it's a big, if, it's, if it's a big project, it has to happen, number one. Number two, um, let's say the due structure hasn't had an increase in 10 years. It's not commensurate with what's going on in the market. And they can really afford it. Yeah, maybe we'll do a thirty or forty percent increase. It's rare, but we'll do it. Now, if it's on Palm Beach and they have to borrow ten million dollars and they're paying a thousand dollars a month, and the increase is going to be a thousand dollars a month, there's an understanding that they could probably absorb that quite well, being that everyone owns all their units. There's no mortgages. They have funded reserves. I mean, so it's not you don't just check the box. It's it's you have to finagle it a bit. It's it's subjective. But to figure out what's realistic, what, what right. their owners can swing in terms right. of that assessment. Right. Conversely, as I mentioned before, when we're going back to Century Village, where the majority of those folks are on fixed incomes and such, $25 a month per unit can make an impact on people. So sometimes, well, as opposed to a 36 year, a 36 month loan, maybe I'll go out another year. Maybe I'll go out to five years and make it $18 a month or $15 a month. Contribution. That makes sense. Well, what are the different types of loans you offer associations? Well, there's really two that that I know of. You know, you have a regular line of credit. It's important that people understand lines of credit. Lines of credit are to fund unscheduled working capital or hurricane needs or any sort of cleanup needs. And lines of credit is something that the bank offers the association. It carves out the bank's asset, sits on the shelf. 
It comes with an annual renewal fee of whatever that factor is, $1,000 or whatever. And hopefully they don't use it, but we want them to use it because how are we supposed to make money if they don't use it? The only thing about that is that people have to understand is that there's a 30-day rest period for these lines of credit, meaning every 12-month period, that loan has to be at zero for 30 days. And that's to avoid it becoming an evergreen loan or line that's out there forever. And all you're doing is paying interest like people do on credit cards. This is meant to be a business line of credit, just like any other business that borrows money to ebb and flow during you know high times and low times in business. And that's what it's supposed to be used for. So if you close a line of credit in July for a million dollars and you don't tap it until say December and you borrow half a million dollars, you have till next December to make that to zero. But let's say we're in hurricane season right now, okay? Mm-hmm. But we tell all of our clients it's always good to have a line, of, an open line of credit in the event that you have, you know, a direct hit with a hurricane or other casualty event. How quickly can you can they draw? Let's say they just closed it and your hurricane sw- swings through, rips off their roofs. They need to immediately draw on it to to tarp the roofs. How quickly can they do that? Well, I mean, if it was signed and closed, you have to give a day or two for booking. Okay. You know? And but the funding is immediate. It's immediate. Hundred percent. Just like a, just like a construction loan, it's it's ready to go. Okay, so you've got the open line of credit. What are their other options? Well, it's the construction loan that we're talking about before, and that's re- and I refer that to as a non-revolving line of credit mm-hmm. term loan. So the first portion of it during the the draw period, it is a, it's a line of credit, but it's not revolving, not like the other one we just talked about. It has a definite amount you can draw from it, and that uh, the available amount reduces by every draw amount. And uh, the client pays interest only during that period of time. So if they borrow nothing in the first month, they don't have any payments. And they borrow, let's say, $100,000 for permits month number two, well, then the next month they're going to pay interest only on the $100,000, and that's going to slowly build. Do you have a and limit then- on the number of months that it can be a line of credit before it converts to a traditional loan? Sure. So basically, and it also it also depends on on what the need of the community is. On smaller loans, so let's say a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand, and they want to do a roof, and it's going to take two months to do the roof. I just made give them a, a just a normal commercial loan and just give it to them, and they start paying principal and interest right away. And that that might be easier for other folks because they don't have to figure out their interest only period and all that stuff. So we do do that, just a commercial loan. You pay P&I for 36 or 48 months or whatever it is. The draw period though, on construction loans that are multifaceted, we could do 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, we can go up to 30 months. Uh, and then we could do an exception of going an additional six months if it's need be. And, and we've had lots of requests to do that. Right. You know, We're very much aware in South Florida that things can delay projects. It could be a hurricane, as you mentioned, or it could be something like nesting turtles. Or it could be other things that uh, that would delay, like you know, or supply, could be chain. supply chain, right? Supply chain or labor issues. You're right. It's get, it's getting harder and harder to calculate how long a construction project is going to take. Yeah, and then, and that's for sure. Plus, sometimes the costs go up too. I have one uh, one client of ours uh, on Palm Beach. We closed a small uh, five or six million dollar loan with them for a period of time, and then within six months, and when they were peeling back all the envelopes of the building, they discovered that they needed a lot more money. And not like another two million, like another eight million. And so that was such a you know a horrific discovery. So what we had to do is we had to modify both loans and go out to a fifteen year amortization in order to you know not be such a burden on the on the homeowners, even though they had the wherewithal just to make it easier for them. So we did a fifteen year am fixed rate for ten, and then the final five years we would have some sort of a, an adjustment to a five year treasury and then fix it again. So what kind of collateral are you looking for, whether it's a line of credit or a traditional loan? So the, the, the collateral is probably the most important piece of, of, the, of the factor, because like I mentioned before, most people have an association with interest rates for a mortgage from, from a house loan or their car loan, and those would be tangible collateral. These are not. These are considered uncollateralized loans. They are uh, def- defined that way. They're defined as actually unsecured. The collateral is the assignment of the assessment and or the special assessment 
for the repayment of the loan, quite simply. You know, we don't have lien rights on the units. The association has all the power. And so if the if the association has a couple of units that decided not to pay or for whatever reason, it's not going to affect the bank at all because the association is still obligated to make that loan payment. So it's the assignment of that assessment. And we can modify that too. But Do you have a preference between a general assignment of assessment versus a special assessment? It really depends if it's a huge project. If it's a smaller project and it can be satisfied with a line item in their budget, they won't have to pass a special assessment. It'll just be the, just assignment of just uh, their general assessments. And sometimes that's sufficient. But on larger projects, they always pass a special assessment usually. Yeah, and a lot of times now, Brewster, we're looking, you know, we're talking to clients that are looking at a, a variety of, so- of sources of revenue. And that may be tapping into reserves, passing a direct special assessment on their owners and obtaining financing. Correct. So they're working off of all of those. You know. We're getting the sense that there's a tightening of financing for associations right now. And you'll tell me whether or not that's an accurate sense. But associations have traditionally been great customers for banks, have they not? I mean, have you ever had one that's defaulted on a loan? No. I've had that question asked so many times. and, and And I have a lot of other friends that are also attorneys that are association attorneys. And they're like, I can't think of one. I mean, I know that there has been a couple that have defaulted to from the from the building the builder's perspective and that has happened but from a from a bank lending someone an association uh, funds for a project no zero that I've ever heard of during the recession we had particularly in, in communities where you had 70 80 percent delinquencies associated with investment purchasers even then they weren't defaulting you know they may there were a few were, were the state appointed receivers. But what those receivers did was collect the the assessments and pay the outstanding debt. So I would imagine for lenders, associations do make attractive customers. They're fantastic. I mean, I don't I'm so happy the bigger banks kind of shy away from this kind of lending because I've made a career out of it. And I think it's great. Well, let's hope they're not listening to this, Brewster. (laughs) It's okay. They can listen. They still can't figure out how to service it. true once you once you've already made a name for yourself in the space it does give you an advantage yeah that's true so let's talk about the depository relationship because this comes up all the time you know and i completely understand the bank wants that depository relationship particularly now with the new law in place you're going to see huge increases in these reserve accounts correct correct but, yeah, that's you know, so most banks want they want the depository relation but a lot want the auto debit out of all the accounts including reserves. That's not really possible with reserve accounts, particularly with the new law that says these structural integrity reserve components must be fully funded at all times. So what's your requirement at Valley National on deposits? We will never be a one-off situation. So we're never going to have someone come to us and we're never going to approve a loan to them. And they're never going to, they're never not going to bank with us. There are a lot of bankers out there that want to pursue Obviously, all the whole relationship, and that's certainly my end too. We would love the whole relationship, but I've always found it to be better for for my career. And what I do is try to winning it one step at a time. So I win the loan. They're obviously going to bank with us because we're not going to fund out of the construction loan a different bank, right? So we're going to open up that construction account, and then we're going to open up probably a small reserve account. And I understand that if they have a very robust operating account, it's the middle of the year, they're up and running. For them to change over to us during the midstream of their operating a year, that's that's a lot. They have they have the coupons out there. It's all set up with lockbox. I understand. I get it. I've been doing this a long time. And I'd like to say to them, listen, I'm going to win your business because at the end of this six months, you're going to want to bring all of it over to me because you're just going to fall in love with our bank. And that's always proven to be true. Uh, I never wanted to start off a relationship that we just won beating up another bank or, or getting better terms it, with like a bad taste in either one of our mouths that I say to him, like, well, now that you now that you, I've won, you mandated the bank with me. Uh, you know, I just never thought that was a good way to, to pursue it. And I got to tell you, you know, 90 percent of the time, they always end up coming over to us anyway. And then they get our Treasury services. Then maybe they tap into our insurance line. We have a lot of other products, but. That initial approach, I want to be their lender and I want and I want to win the rest of it. So some of some bankers want to go in and just say, this is what we've got. Just open up the coats. We have all of these great things and we're going to be great for you. I, I don't know. You know what? It's 
you, you've actually made me jump forward because I wanted to ask you towards the end of this episode about the perception, you know, back in my parents' day, they knew their banker, okay? They liked their banker. And my dad was an entrepreneur. He, hey, he was a small business owner. He knew the bank and he knew the commercial banker he did business with. That's not the perception. When I ask clients today, like, who's your bank? Who's your banker? They won't typically name a person. They'll name an institution. And they really won't have that relationship with that institution. But I think what you're saying is that the relationship is what creates that sense of loyalty and wanting to continue to do business together. No, 100% I agree. Everything in business has always, always been about relationships. And I always will want it to be. Relationships are everything. Everything that we have, whether it's with our kids or whether it's with our parents or whether it's with our neighbors. And everything is based on relationships. And if you come across less than authentic, no one's going to want to do further business with you. You may have given the best rate. You may have given the best terms. And now they're going to be stuck with you. They, they don't want that. They, they want to feel good about it because every decision that we make is based on how we feel about things. And relationships are really important. So, yeah, we want we want to come off very sincere. We want to come off caring because we really do care. You know, that's why I go sit with these boards and I, I work through the process. I'm not just in it for a quick, you know, 30 days. I'll sit with the board. I got a great story. I'll just tell you 30 seconds there back in the day when AR was through the roof, there was this association in Lake Worth. They came to me for new roofs and I looked at their AR. I'm like, I said, there's just no way we're going to lend to you. I said, but you know, you need them. So I work with them for two years and we meet with them once a quarter with their attorney, with their property management company and their insurance person and their board to look at their AR. We slowly, slowly turn the corner. And within just under two years, we approved them for a $700,000 loan and got all their roofs done. And it was just, it was great to be a part of that because, you know, it is, we're all in this together. And I want people to feel that if they're going to work with me, I want them to feel that from me. I think that's a great philosophy. You know, I've had some clients recently, associations, not individuals, associations thinking about PACE loans for let's say the roof. Have you seen an increase in that? And and what can you say about, you know, that is an option for yeah. an association? Yeah, I, I, I'm not crazy about that product. I don't think it's a good product for them. There's not a lot of flexibility on the, on the back end of that product. And that's what makes our, our product so much more appealing, I think, because all of our loans don't have any prepayment penalties. We can re-amortize our loans up to four times a year. Um, with principal reductions, you know, it's a very flexible product, but when you get locked into a PACE loan, there's not a lot of flexibility with anything having to do with with the government loan or anything like that. It just explain how it works. It's tied to the real estate taxes. That's what I, that's what I've come to believe. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's on there for a long, it's on there. I mean, how can you pay it? Can you ever pay it down? Can you ever pay it off? I, I don't know. I think the product works for single family homeowners who make their decision, hey, I'm going to take this loan. It's going to be on on my property taxes for my roof or my windows or what have you. I'm still trying to work out the mechanics for an association to do that. I'm not sure the product's there yet. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. So just pivoting a little bit. You know, you we've talked about uh, you, the bank as, as a partner with associations in terms of their capital improvement and repair and maintenance projects. Some of our association documents, Brewster, particularly older ones, require an insurance trustee when there's an insurance payout. And I truly believe this was put in by developers years ago because, I don't know, they didn't trust boards to handle uh, large insurance proceeds. So have you been asked, have, has Valley National served in that capacity? Not to my knowledge, I've never been asked that. I mean, I get it. I can I can conceptualize it, but I can't imagine we would ever be named that or asked to be involved in that. We certainly I don't think, have that. I think it's in there, and people are just ignoring it. Probably, it's never been in a new set of documents. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the older documents speak to other issues too when it comes to the voting rights and how they actually have to pass stuff. And 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 I've sat with a lot of associations say you need to redo your docs. You need to get with your attorney. Redo your docs, make sure it's good because as it sets, as your docs are written right now, there's no way I can do a loan for you. Boards have varying degrees of sophistication when it comes to vetting the professional advisors they hire, the contractors they use. You know, it's difficult. You know, they can't just log on and find, you know, what's the best of the best here. Sometimes they're scrambling, sometimes it's word of mouth, sometimes it's Google search, but 
as I said at the outset, there are so many associations in Florida right now that are going to need financing in the next in the coming years. How do they vet the lenders in this space? Yeah, that's that's a fair question. You know, one of one of the tools that Valley has developed in the past few years is is a is a pretty robust 800 number and also a website for HOAs that you can click on. You do a search HOA Florida and you're going to find Valley and it's this pretty incredible website. And then there's a couple of things you can click on. And then anyway, the long story is you click on an email, it'll go to something called PM, which stands for Property Management HOA. And I get a lot of these leads that come in for these questions about finance. That's where I'm, I'm leading to. And so some of these smaller loans came in. I got an opportunity to talk to the president or the treasurer, and they don't know what they're talking about. They, don't, they ask all these great questions, and I have to spend time with them, and I'd like to, to make them feel more comfortable about what they're dealing with. Too many times over the years, I've sat in boards, and they're just so nervous, and they're so afraid. I try to just calm them down and be a friend and just say, hey, listen, you know, it, it's going to be okay. But to your point, how do they find folks like yourself and folks like me? It's word of mouth, you know, honestly. I mean, yeah, they could do Google searches. They can start, they can dial for dollars. They can do yellow pages or whatever people do for searches. But the only best way to find their best people are to call other boards that are doing projects and ask them, hey, who's your consultant? Who's your banker? Who's your attorney? You know, are you happy with what's going on? And that's how, that's how it works. I've built my business on Palm Beach that way for the past, like I said, 16 years. So that's the best way to do it. They have to ask around. Who are you most comfortable dealing with? Is it the manager? Is it the treasurer? Is it the president? Is it a combination of the uh, of these people? I'm comfortable dealing with anybody. I like to deal with them all. I got that sense from you, Brewster. <laughs> <laughs> but I honestly, I mean, who should you be dealing with? Well, I mean, the president and the board of directors are the decision makers. However, sometimes they're just not equipped, and sometimes you have the property manager as the person that you want to deal with. Sometimes it's the CPA that you want to deal with. Sometimes it's their attorney. So, you know, you really have to figure out respectfully who's going to be driving the bus in this project. And luckily, so most of these boards are pretty sophisticated. They know what's going on. Sometimes they're overly sophisticated and they've all had these fantastic professional careers in different cities across the country. And they come into the situation thinking they may be the smartest people in the room, which is really funny because they've never done this type of a loan before. They don't know what they're, they're experts of what they do. You know, I have to kind of come in and humble myself and say, just kind of let them talk. And then I can kind of come in and sort of educate them a little bit in in a very respectful way. So presidents are great to deal with. You know, they got voted into it. So that's who I want to talk to for sure. But sometimes presidents don't like to deal with money. So I deal with the treasurer, you know, it depends. Oh, gotcha. So I liked your story about the association that you couldn't approve at first, but two years later, after doing the hard work, you were able to approve them. Is it possible to give me a percentage of of associations that do get approved that come across your desk? What would you say? Uh, Nowadays, 100. Wow. Well, I mean, they're, they're not going to get past me. Like, I'm not going to put in a loan that I know is not going to get approved if that if that's what you're asking me so how many loans do i submit that get approved uh, that request approval well all of them but not like that. for example how many, how many do you not re- not submit for approval that's a fair question so <laughs> so yes when we are in the preliminary stages of trying to figure out what makes sense i try to ask all those upfront questions right all those qualifying questions and those details how's your ar aging what are the values of the units what are you looking to do uh and the they want to do a million dollars worth of something and their values are 50,000. There's only 24 of them. They're not going to get approved. So we're not going to waste everyone's time. But if it's going to be a multi-phase project, I say, well, let's get together and bite off what we can chew. Do the math, figure out what the payment's going to be ahead of time, right out of the gate before you even try to have it approved. So they kind of some sort of a sense of what it's going to cost. When I provide a bank consideration letter or a term sheet, I kind of break down in an illustration on what the payment is going to be and basically what it's going to cost per unit to contribute to that payment. So they get a sense because when I sit with the boards and we start talking about these things, I ask them, what's the most important thing we're talking about? They're like, what do you mean? I said, the most important thing we're talking about is how much is it going to cost? What's it going to cost me? I own a unit and I want to know what it's going to cost me. I don't care about all the other stuff. I just want to know one thing. What's this going to cost me every single month? I I need to know now what I can afford before we start really doing it. 
And then once you get a handle on that, it's going to cost 150 bucks a month. Oh, okay, great. Let's go forward. We can probably figure out how to do it. Oh, it's going to cost me 750. Yeah, we need to rethink this because I don't think I can afford that. Yeah, but you know what, Brewster? You know as well as I do that condos and cooperative buildings along the coast were marketed for decades as the most cost-effective housing option in Florida, right? I just had another guest on and, you know, that's the little slice of paradise. But now it's becoming the most expensive housing option as opposed to a, a single family home inland. There are people, no matter what you do in, in terms of trying to keep the cost low, they're not going to be able to afford living in an older condominium or cooperative along the coast. Yeah, that's true. That is 100 percent true. That's the sad fact of reality. Yeah. But we are in a, we are in a market right now. My prior guest is a real estate professional. And her point was it's the right time to sell if you don't think that, you know, living in a building along the coast is for you in terms of the upkeep. Yeah, now's a good time to get out of that. Along those lines, from an underwriting perspective, if you're looking at leasing, what are you doing in terms of looking at safety and structural integrity? Yeah, that's a very good question. So one of the things since Surfside um, that we're really looking at is if there is a, a reserve study, engineering study, all those things, we want copies of everything. And we're going to look at them really closely and make sure that, number one, it's been maintained. Number two, that you know they have a plan in place. One of my requirements also is when I ask for all of my due diligence and all my documents, one of the things I ask for is I ask for 12 months worth of meeting minutes. And someone's like, why do you want 12 months of meeting minutes? Because I, I want to know the story. I want to know what's been going on here for 12 months. I want to know that they're like, at least been talking about doing this project. At least it's, you know, it's not, it's not just coming up with last minute. So yeah, we take those documents very seriously. We take a very good look at them. We're not engineers, right? But we have experience in this and we've, and we also know who the players are. With so much time in the saddle, we know who the good engineers are. We know who the ones that are okay. We know who the great construction people are. And if there's a new name that pops up, well, where'd that guy come from? Okay, remember when we had to do all the re-roofs around here many years ago, and all of a sudden you had so many roofers? Well, where'd they come from? Well, you're going to have new names pop up, as you well know, with this sure. new law in place. You're going to have new names pop up. I mean, I appreciate your comment. You're not engineers. Lawyers aren't engineers. Accountants aren't engineers. The board members aren't engineers. And even if they have an engineer on the board, they shouldn't be delving into that. You need to hear it straight from the horse's mouth. So mm -hmm. perhaps from a lender's perspective, maybe that means getting the engineer on the phone for a conversation. Oh, for sure. hundred percent. Or attending a board or membership meeting where that engineer explains the report. Yeah, we're definitely going to have, that's going to be some, some higher level stuff that we're going to be doing. We haven't done before in the past. But this one-off accident, terrible tragedy down there is causing the whole industry to change a little bit. And I think it should. You know? Again, if we come out of this with, with safer housing stock in Florida, that's the goal. Absolutely. hundred percent. And and people's evaluations are going to continue to go up too. You know, you're making these these buildings sturdier and stronger and more attractive. And, uh, and people with lots of money in their pockets, they're still going to want to live in these apartments on the on the ocean for sure. What about making our hotels and office buildings like I'm sitting right now on the 17th floor of my building? Uh, what about making all that stock safer, too? Isn't that interesting? Well, I you know what? That's a whole that's different laws. Right. I mean, it's it's I not. Know. I know. It's well, a whole different I thing. checked into a hotel and said, can I see your safety report? Please? <laughs> I okay. have never done that. <laughs> but maybe somebody will after I mention this. So, Brewster, any final thoughts for our listeners? Well, you know, um, I just thank you so much for for uh, asking me to join you today. I'm uh, I'm quite humbled that you would consider me uh, and to hear what I have to say, and and uh, and I'm very proud of the work that we do here at Valley and and for this industry, and I think it's a great industry be, to be in. And uh, I just thank you again for having me on. Just don't be afraid out there to to delve into you know the unknown because these these boards out there that they're very very nervous, they're very skittish, they don't know what to do. None, a lot of them have never been in business before. And all of a sudden, now they're tasked with this fantastic project that they have to do. So it's important to call their attorney, call their engineer, call a friend, call their banker and, and get, you know, get educated and, and make notes and, uh, you know, talk to people. But don't make any decisions about anything that you don't feel good about. I can just tell you that. Well, I want to thank you and all of your time today. And I, and I don't want to be corny about this, but... We say at the intro that we uh, we speak condo and HOA, 
I speak to a lot of people. You are definitely fluent in condo and HOA. You know thank this you. segment of the market inside and out. So thanks thank for joining you. us today. Appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Do appreciate it. Thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to follow and rate us on your favorite podcast platform or visit TakeItToTheBoard.com for more ways to connect. Thank you.